for those who are interested in the real world, uh, a look at the actual history suggests an adjustment, uh, a modification of free market theory to what we might call really existing free market theory. That is the one that's actually applied, not talked about. And the principle of really existing free market theory is free markets are fine for you, but not for me. Uh, that's again near a universal. So you, whoever you may be, uh, you have to learn responsibility and be subjected to market discipline. It's good for your character, it's tough love, and so on and so forth. But me, uh, I need the nanny state to protect me from market discipline uh, so that I'll be able to rant and rave about the uh, marvels of the free market while I'm getting properly subsidized and defended by everyone else through the nanny state. And also, this uh, has to be risk-free. So I'm perfectly willing to make profits, but I don't want to take risks. Uh, if anything goes wrong, you bail me out. Okay. So if uh, third world debt gets out of control, you socialize it. It's not the problem of the banks that made the money. Uh, when the SNLs collapse, you know, same thing. Public bails them out. Uh, when American investment firms get into trouble because the Mexican bubble bursts, uh, you bail out Goldman Sachs. Uh, and uh, the Me Mexico bailout, and uh, uh, on and on. I mean, there's case after case of this. In fact, of the uh, le leading top 100 leading transnationals in the Fortune list of transnationals, there was a recent study of how they how they related to the states in which they're they're all somewhere, you know. So they're all mostly here in some national state. It turns out that all hundred of them had benefited from industrial policies, meaning state intervention in their behalf, uh, all 100 had benefited uh, from the state in which they're based, and 20 of the 100 had been saved from total disaster, that is, collapse, uh, by just state bailout. Uh, when people talk about globalization of the economy, remember that the nanny state has to be very powerful in order to bail out the rich, uh, and nothing is changing in that regard. 20 out of 100, again, uh, were saved from collapse by this, including a number here. Well, that's really existing free market theory. There are many examples of it quite close to home, so we could start with our own governor, Governor Weld, uh, who's described by the Boston Globe as a libertarian with a religious belief in free markets. Uh, and then a couple of days later, they reported that through various scams, uh, he had, he, his administration was able to sharply increase uh, federal subsidies to Massachusetts uh, so that way beyond what they were before, so that he could parade as a fiscal conservative. And that's pretty common. Just a year before, uh, you may recall, if you have long memories, uh, they had to close Georgia's Bank, the richest fishing area in the world, uh, because it was over, being overfished thanks to a combination of deregulation and subsidies to the fishing industry, which have that odd consequence that you tend to get overfishing. Uh, so it looked as if the ground fish were wiped out and they had to close it off. Uh, it didn't take long for the religious conserv uh, libertarian fanatic uh, William Will to take the next jet plane down to Washington, hat in hand, uh, asking for a federal bailout. He wanted the national federal government to declare it a, a natural disaster. Uh, and the reason was, as he explained with presumably some scientists in tow, uh, that there was some strange kind of predatory fish uh, which no one had yet found, but they would find it, don't worry. So some kind of predatory fish had come and sort of wiped out all the, you know, the cod and the haddock and all those things. So it was a natural disaster, and therefore the general public had to sort of pay off the results of uh, deregulation and subsidizing the fishing industry. Well, that's the way to be a libertarian uh, with religious fervor. Uh, another one is uh, the leader of the conservative revolution, Newt Gingrich, uh, nobody's more passionate about the market than he is, uh, particular about what he, his own district, which he calls a Norman Rockwell world of jet planes and fiber optics, as indeed it is, uh, except if you ask where jet planes and fiber optics came from, uh, you discover that the public paid for them and still pays for them. Uh, and in fact, uh, he manages to get more federal subsidies for his district than any suburban county in the country outside the federal system. So you can have conservatism flowering among the malls and so on. Or you can go back to the Reaganites, who are also very passionate about free markets for everyone else. Uh, meanwhile, they boasted to the American business community uh, 
correctly, that they had done more, that they had instituted more protection than any post-war American administration, in fact, more than all of them combined. Uh, they had doubled import restrictions, uh, blocking, uh, and recap helped and poured public funds into major industries to enable them to recapitalize, uh, to pr protect, uh, the, in fact, reconstruct the steel industry and the automotive industry and the semiconductors and so on. Uh, which would have disappeared if they'd opened the market. Uh, the Thatcherites in England were about the same. Uh, government expenditures relative to GNP stayed pretty constant, although anything that went to the general population collapsed. Uh, meanwhile, military industry shot up. Uh, arms sales are booming. I think that's all publicly subsidized stuff. Arms sales to nice guys like Saddam Hussein and General Suharto and others. Well, that's uh, really existing free market theory. What are the core policies? Uh, well, the Washington Consensus, which is basically designed for the third world to make it that way and keep it that way, uh, it's now being applied uh, not just to the third world countries, but to uh, the rich industrial societies with the United States and Britain uh, in the lead. However, it's with a twist. Since it's being applied at home, this is really existing free market theory that's being applied at home meaning nuanced. You know. So powerful government to protect the rich and market discipline and tough love for everyone else. Uh, and uh, you see that very clearly. Go through the various elements of the Washington Consensus. The first one is to re about reducing government. Uh, well, that's false. We're not reducing government. Uh, we're switching, shifting it around. So social spending is indeed way down since the 1970s when this stuff started accelerated after 1980, but it was starting in the mid-70s. Uh, the uh, uh, kind of a benchmark example is uh, AFDC, the main support system. Uh, that was cut up virtually in half from about 1970 to 1990, with obvious effects on poor families and children and so on. It was part of a general war against women and children that was conducted by the conservatives under the name of Family Values. It's interesting that they were able to get away with that. That tells you something about the intellectual culture. Uh, well, one part was the reduction of AFDC from, by roughly half from about 1970 to about 1990. It's now essentially gone. Uh, that's the uh, purpose of that, as you know, is so that seven million, a couple of million, uh, I think five or six million kids, average seven years old, can learn responsibility. That's part of tough love. Uh, meanwhile, another part of the government has been very stable and, in fact, is going up, uh, namely the Pentagon system, which uh, remains at approximately Cold War levels. In fact, higher now than it was under Nixon, although you know the big enemy has disappeared, which tells you exactly how much, tells a rational person at least, exactly how much they were worried about the Russian threat. Uh, not only does it remain at Cold War levels, but it's going up uh, under the uh, initiative of the fiscal conservatives, the Heritage Foundation, which you know, sort of the right-wing foundation that designs the budget for the Gingrich Army, are calling for an increase in the Pentagon system, as is Gingrich, as indeed was Clinton. Uh, so that goes up, uh, and uh, uh, I should say that cutting of social spending, uh, social spending is being cut very sharply. Uh, very much over public opposition. Uh, at the time of the 1994 congressional election, you know, the big landslide, uh, over 60% of the public wanted social spending to increase. Okay, went very sharply down. What about Pentagon spending going up? Well, that's, uh, this public is six to one opposed to that, uh, which gives you some one, one aspect of a big picture about what's happening to American democracy. I mean somewhat of a change, not a huge change. Uh, the, uh, so one part of the system is going up, Pentagon spending. Another part's going down, social spending. And the same is true in other domains. Like, for example, legal aid for the poor is being slashed and virtually destroyed. Uh, on the other hand, the security system, states, the government security system, state and federal, that's going up. Uh, so prisons are going way up. Uh, the prison population Crime hasn't really hasn't changed for about 20 years, uh, but and, and incidentally, U.S. crime rates are not off the spectrum, contrary to what a lot of people believe. Uh, crime rates are, are sort of a, toward the high end of the industrial world, but not 
off the spectrum, with one exception, uh, namely murder with guns. Uh, but that's a special feature of American society, which doesn't have to do with crime rates. Uh, apart from that, crime rates are kind of toward the high end, not going up. Uh, the prison population tripled during the Reagan years is going up even faster now. Uh, and I think the reason is another aspect of the third world model, namely the superfluous population. Uh, there is a big superfluous population. They don't contribute to wealth protection. Well, we're civilized folks. We're not like the people we fund in Colombia who go out and murder them, so we throw them into jail. Uh, and uh, that's going way up in even more. Uh, and there's also a kind of like a side benefit to this. Uh, the putting more and more people in jail, and in fact under harsher and harsher conditions, uh, has an, has a, is a technique of social control for everybody else. I mean, when you're, if you're, you know, one, someday down the road you decide to run a dictatorship uh, and you want to really harm people, it's kind of like Hitler Germany or something, you know, you, you, you know that you're going to carry out policies that are going to cause people a lot of harm. Uh, you've got to control them somehow. And there aren't many ways to do it. Everyone hits on the same ways. Uh, what you do is engender fear and hatred and, you know, make them hate the guy who looks a little different or whatever it may be. Uh, and uh, then you punish those bad guys because they're really awful and you punish them really hard and so on and that makes people even more frightened. Uh, you can just see that happening right around you. And uh, uh, building up the perception of crime, crime has a like a, you know, what they call in literary theory a subtext. You're supposed to understand criminal has the word, little word black in front of it, just like welfare mother, you know, black, rich black welfare mother. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and criminal means, you know, that black guy is coming after you. So uh, uh, what you want to do is, uh, and this has the dual effect of getting rid of a superfluous population, basically unskilled workers, you know, close race class correlation, uh, and uh, uh, also demonizing them so everybody else is scared and frightened and they'll be willing to accept what's happening to them too and not look at where the source is. Uh, so that part of the, uh, the, the drug wars basically for this has almost nothing to do with drugs, but it has plenty to do with criminalizing an unwanted population and scaring everybody else. And, and so does the harshening of uh, prison conditions, which is really, it's, uh, the United States is off the map on this one in violation of international conventions, constantly condemned in human rights forums and getting much worse. Uh, the reinstitution of chain gangs uh, was of course bitterly condemned, but you know, that's that bad South. Alabama. Well, it's now in Illinois. The state senate of Illinois last week or two ago uh, legislated chain gangs, not for violent criminals, incidentally, uh, for people who are found with drugs or, you know, robbed a store or something like that. Uh, the Chicago Press pointed out that this uh, carries uh, this kind of reminiscent of slavery. Uh, but the legislator and the senator, state senator who put it through, said that this is just another aspect of what he called tough love. And then he explained that some people work better under humiliation. Uh, so it's really good to restore elements of slavery. And again, the subtext is everybody else gets scared. You know, if those guys have to walk around like slaves in chains, we're, we must be in real danger. So therefore, we'll accept what's happening to us. That's the logic. Uh, so prisons are going up. Uh, and, uh, uh, it's, uh, and that has a lot of side benefits. Uh, apart from just getting rid of the superfluous population, it is a source of cheap labor. So prison labor is going way up. Uh, cheap labor, you don't have to worry about unions, no benefits, they don't get out of line. Uh, for, and that also naturally undercuts wages elsewhere. So when, just like forcing welfare mothers to work, you know, raising children isn't work as anybody knows who's had children. Uh, so you have to drive them to work, kind of like people who go to you know, fidelity investment to figure out the scams about how to deal with the security market. You really want these people to work. But since there's no jobs for them, they're going to work at low paid or sub publicly subsidized wages, which will undercut other wages. And the same with uh, uh, prison labor. Uh, all, uh, in fact, the scale of prison construction, uh, which is a kind of Keynesian stimulus to the economy anyway, but its scale has become so enormous that even high tech industry you know, the guys who are usually just ripping off the Pentagon system, they're beginning to look at it, figuring out, uh, con rec recognizing that uh, high-tech surveillance devices and so on may be another way to sort of get the transfer of public funds to make sure that uh, high-tech industry keeps moving. It's reached, it's not the scale of the Pentagon, but it's going up. Uh, well, that's one aspect of what's called reducing government. 
uh, modifying government, to be more precise. Uh, another aspect of it is what's called devolution, you know, reducing, moving governmental power from federal to the state level. Uh, and that has a kind of a rationale which you hear all over the time, place. For example, there was an op-ed a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times by uh, John Kogan, the Hoover Institute at Stanford, uh, who pointed out what he called a philosophical issue that divides the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, the philosophical issue is that the Democrats believe in big government and entitlement, and the Republicans believe in getting power down closer to the people, uh, to the states, because they're kind of populist types. Well, uh, it takes about maybe three seconds thought uh, to recognize, to realize that moving power down to the states uh, in funding and so on is just moving it away from the people. Uh, for perfectly elementary reason, there's a hidden part of the system, of the power system, that you're not supposed to know about or think about, and that's private power. Now, it takes a big corporation like, say, General Electric or Microsoft to sort of pressure the federal government, but even middle-sized guys have no problems with state governments. They can control them quite easily. And in case anyone was too dull to figure this out by themselves, uh, the same day as Kogan's op-ed in the New York Times, which is a typical one, uh, the, there was a story in the Wall Street Journal about Massachusetts, uh, which had a headline that read, uh, what fidelity investment wants, it usually gets. Okay. And then the story went on to say that Fidelity Investment, the biggest investment firm in Massachusetts, uh, wanted even more uh, subsidy and support from the state government that it already gets. And it was threatening if it didn't, it would move over the border to Rhode Island, where it just owns the place. Uh, so therefore, the uh, passionately libertarian governor quickly rearranged you know, tax subsidies and one thing or another so that Fidelity got what it wanted. Well, Fidelity couldn't have done that with the federal government. Couldn't have said, you know, you give us even more, we're going to move to Switzerland or something. I mean, other guys can do it maybe, but not Fidelity. Uh, Raytheon, which is the biggest manufacturing uh, producer, did the same thing. Raytheon, uh, incidentally, Fidelity, is not, it's not that Fidelity is poor. They just announced record, record profits a couple of days ago. Uh, same with Raytheon, just announced record profits, but you know, having big problems. Uh, so they wanted even a bigger tax subsidy and uh, direct subsidy and tax write-offs, which just means transfer of taxes to, uh, from the state of Massachusetts. And they threatened if they didn't get them, they were going to go to Tennessee. So of course they got them. The legislature passed a special uh, law giving what they call defense industry special extra subsidies. Uh, Notice that Raytheon is publicly subsidized in the first place. That's where its money comes from. But now it has to be additionally subsidized so that its uh, profits will be even higher than the record profits it just made. Same with Fidelity. Uh, and that's the kind of game anybody can, you know, even, even way down to much smaller businesses can play with states. And the consequences of devolution are quite straightforward. Uh, it means that uh, any funding that goes to, say, block grants that go to the states, uh, you can be reasonably confident that they'll end up in the deep pockets of rich people, not uh, you know, in, the, uh, in the hands of uh, hungry children or uh, poor mothers or anything like that. Uh, that's how you get power down to the people. Okay, that's devolution. Uh, and in fact, quite generally, when you look at it, what's called government cutting uh, is, uh, is more or less cost transfer. It's almost never reduction. Sometimes it's increase. So let's take what's called take health reform. Reform is a word you always ought to watch out for. You know, like when Mao called, started the Cultural Revolution, it wasn't called a reform. You know? Reform is a change that you're supposed to like. Okay? Uh, and watch, so as soon as you hear the word reform, you kind of reach for your wallet and see who's lifting it. Uh, anyhow, the, there are things called health reforms. Uh, and the health reforms uh, are supposed to you know, cut government costs. Well, they do cut one kind of cost, but of course they raise another kind of cost. Uh, there's a very respectable outfit called the uh, National Bipartisan Leadership Council, uh, headed by uh, two ex-presidents, Ford and Carter. Uh, and it just did a study of the cost transfer effects of the planned health reforms. Uh, it concluded that they would add about $10 billion a year extra costs but those extra costs will come from wages, 
and higher premiums, okay, which means it's a highly regressive tax on the poor, highly regressive tax, you know, if it comes from wages and premiums, of course. And that's $10 billion a year. They also estimated that it'll increase the number of uninsured by 15 to 20 percent. Up by this is by the year 2002, so up to about 54 million by the year 2002. Well, that's a cost, uh, big cost, an unmeasurable cost. Uh, so, and, and, the, and so you find all the way across the board, and furthermore, it's no big secret. So, like the Wall Street Journal had a headline which pointed out that when the reforms were, you know, moving through Congress, it said rich gain poor lose trade-offs for the middle class, okay? Uh, which is right, that's exactly what the reforms are intended to do. You have to remember my middle class, they mean the people right below the very rich. So they don't mean the median, you know, they're not talking about people with 30,000 a year income. Uh, they mean every, you know, so what it really means is great for the rich, super rich, trade-offs for those, the near rich, uh, Tough business, tough love for everybody else, which is most everyone. Uh, when you close public hospitals and that sort of thing, you know exactly who's going to suffer. Uh, well, let's go to uh, what are called, take say New York, which it has two, a conservative governor and a conservative uh, uh, mayor, and they're carrying out very extensive conservative tax cuts because they're fiscal conservatives. Uh, the tax cuts, the New York Times pointed out in a small item, uh, all benefit business. So, by accident, all the tax cuts benefit business. Well, there are also tax increases, which are compensating for the tax cuts, but they don't call them tax increases. What they call them is, uh, the phrase is, reduction of subsidies for public transportation and for tuition in public universities. Well, subsidy itself is another interesting word, kind of like reform. Uh, it's a subsidy if public funds are used for public purposes. That's called a subsidy. It's not called a subsidy when they go to private wealth. That's reform or something. Uh, so, the, uh, 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 so they're cutting down subsidies for public transportation. Well, that's just a tax. You know, if you pay 20% more for getting on the subway, that's tax. Same if uh, you pay higher tuition at City College. You know. uh, and that's a highly regressive tax. So who rides the subways uh, and who goes to City College? Uh, so what they're doing is, shift is cutting taxes for business, for the rich, and increasing taxes for the poor, uh, which are going to compensate for that. In, and that's called fiscal conservatism uh, and cutting government. Well, so it is across the board. Uh, you take, uh, I'll come to other examples, but if you think about it, all the th take a, look, a close look at the things that are called cutting government, you'll notice they quite characteristically have this property. Uh, the next element of the Washington Consensus is making the tax system more regressive. Okay, we don't have to talk about that. It's stated openly. Uh, the thing that isn't stated openly is the reason. This is supposed to be in order to uh, increase investment and give, or give everyone jobs. Uh, but it's a really weird way to do that. I mean, the country is already a washing capital. Uh, the people whose taxes are being cut don't know what to do with their money. If you want to increase growth, there's another approach that might be used, in, uh, stimulate weak demand uh, by progressive taxes, that is, put more money into the, hand, into the hands of people who can spend it. That increases growth, that would increase growth, uh, but that's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is by cutting financial gains so that you can have more speculation against currencies. Uh, the, uh, so that's the second part, make the tax system more regressive. Uh, what about deregulation? Well, same effect. Deregulation is a cost-shifting measure. So, for example, if you deregulate, uh, if you allow industries to, as they've done already, uh, to deposit toxic wastes without cost, because you have deregulation, it increases their profits, but it also increases water and sewage rates, which is a regressive tax uh, on everybody else who's got to pay that. Uh, also, it has further costs. Some of them you can't estimate. Uh, for example, the costs in, say, health and quality of life and so on. No way to give numbers to those. Uh, and there's also going to be the eventual cost of cleanup, but that's going to be a public cost, remember. Incidentally, a good one, because when you clean up the wastes, that increases the gross national product, and we all like to see that go up. Uh, but the public will pay those costs. So what it is is just another form of radical cost-shifting. Uh, increase 
uh, wealth for the rich and decrease it for everyone else. So it fits the experiment's design. Uh, and in, in general, it's kind of like a short-term profit gain for some, very small sum, and a big cost for everyone else. Uh, what about deregulating the labor market? Well, uh, same process. Actually, that was done by simply criminal behavior. Uh, the best review of this I know is in Business Week. Uh, the Reagan administration, as they point out, essentially f inf informed the corporate world that they were not going to enforce the laws. Uh, there are laws, you know, much hated laws like the Wagner Act on, uh, that give you the right to organize, and the Reagan administration simply informed business they weren't going to enforce them. Uh, so the number of illegal firings uh, went up by about a factor of six, uh, and similarly across the board. They also informed business they were not going to enforce the OSHA regulations, health and safety regulations. So the number of days lost to injury and uh, the number of injuries and so on also shot up. Uh, and in fact, that was a great way to undermine unions and the right to organize, a whole pile of policies like that, which was part of deregulating uh, labor markets. Uh, another part of deregulation of labor markets is to make them more, what's called more flexible meaning you don't have any security and no guarantees, number of temporary workers goes right up, way up, no benefits, uh, you never know if you're going to have a job tomorrow. Uh, that's really good for the economy. That's good for having jobs. Some of the most profitable corporations, the ones who's way up on the Fortune 500 list and booming, are uh, the ones that what they call sell manpower, you know, like Manpower Incorporated, uh, uh, selling temp temps. Uh, which is terrific for making labor markets flexible. It happens to destroy everybody's life, but that doesn't really matter. Uh, it's, uh, th again, the similarity to the third world is very close. Uh, back in 19, this is what's called economic health, and when, you, when this carry goes, happens, you call it an economic miracle, another technical term. So, for example, Brazil was a terrific economic miracle under the neo-Nazi generals that we installed with great self-adulation back in the 60s. And by 1971, it had become the Latin American darling of the business community. And the president, the general who ran the place, pointed out that uh, uh, the economy is doing fine. It's just that the people aren't. Uh, well, we just, uh, we have a Nobel Prize winner who just won the Nobel Prize last year, last time, uh, Robert Lucas of uh, Chicago. And he was interviewed by the Wall Street Journal and said, we've been doing great and have been for a long time. Uh, he didn't even bother to add what the uh, Brazilian general did. It's only the people who aren't doing well. What he means by we is the top 5% or maybe top 10%, and that's right. We've been doing great. We're doing fine. The economy's fine. By now, we don't even worry about the fact that the people aren't doing so well like I won't bother repeating the statistics, which you know, and he knows perfectly well. Okay, that's uh, economic miracles. We're now beginning to get one ourselves. Uh, what about privatization? Well, again, the effects of that are obvious. So, say, in the latest economic miracle in Mexico, uh, privatization meant, as usual, handing over public assets to friends of the president or, you know, other rich people or international investors at a fraction of their cost. Uh, uh, and in fact, in Mexico, the number of billionaires during the economic miracle went up even faster than the percentage of people on the poverty line, uh, as some were doing well and the people didn't happen to be doing so well. Uh, in fact, it was a catastrophe for them, uh, even before the collapse. So that's privatization. Uh, what about property rights? Uh, increase of property rights. That's very important. In fact, it's a critical aspect of the uh, what are called misleadingly the free trade agreements, which actually have strong protectionist elements in them, Uruguay Round and NAFTA and so on. And one of them is uh, increase of intellectual property rights. I'll go into the details, but what it amounts to is uh, guaranteeing that uh, major corporations have a monopoly on the technology and knowledge of the future. And they extended those to the by various devices so that it's about 50 years before you can interfere with owned property which comes from public subsidy usually through research and then is handed over to some private corporation and nobody else is allowed to touch it. So increasing property rights has a big effect, highly protectionist measure which is central to the new trade agreements. 
uh, and has a long lasting effect way down the road on organizing the international economy and who gains and who loses. Uh, last element of the Washington Consensus is reducing trade barriers. And here there's another scam that you ought to keep your eyes on. Uh, the t what's called trade in economics is a very odd notion. So for example, if Ford Motor Company moves parts from Indiana to Illinois for assembly and then moves them back to Indiana, that's not called trade. But if Ford Motor Company takes parts in, made in Indiana and moves them across the border to Mexico, where you can get much cheaper labor and you don't have to worry about the, you know, pollution and so on, and they get reassembled in Mexico and then sent back to, say, Illinois for value added, that's called exports and imports. Never had anything to do with the Mexican economy or, in fact, any economy. It was all internal to the Ford Motor Company, but it's exports and imports. Uh, so how big an element is that? Well, about 50% of U.S. trade. So about 50% of what's called U.S. trade is actually internal to individual corporations, meaning controlled by a very visible hand with all sorts of methods around for uh, distortion of markets and you know, robbery and so on and so forth. And fifth, it's about the same for Japan. And for the world, you know, it's hard to get numbers, but what's estimated for the world is around 40% of trade. Um, agreements like, say, the Uruguay round, you know, GATT, uh, if that increases tr what's called trade, uh, what, it, what it actually does is increase investor rights. That is, it increases the power of transnational corporations. You have to really look pretty closely to figure out what the effect is on trade in any meaningful sense. For example, it may, it may increase cross-border operations, but decrease trade in a meaningful sense of trade, meaning something that's not under the control of a kind of corporate mercantilism. Going on with this, it's perhaps worth noticing that the very concept of capitalism and markets has virtually disappeared. Uh, so for example, if you take the current issue of foreign affairs, um, there's uh, an article by Joseph Nye of the Kennedy School, I think maybe it's the dean of the Kennedy School, uh, who explains that uh, there's a big new weapon in the hands of American diplomat. American diplomacy, he says, has a f diplomacy has a force multiplier. And the reason is because of the attraction of democracy and free market enthusiasms of the United States. That's given those things have given the U.S. a real force multiplier. And then he spells it out. It comes from Cold War investments in high technology, electronics, aviation, telecommunications, and so on. Uh, that's uh, our free market enthusiasms and democracy. Well, where did electronics and you know, uh, aviation and telecommunications come from? Well, from public funds. Uh, they didn't have anything to do with the free market. They came from public funds, uh, which were transferred to high technology industry under the conscious guise, deceit of security. And it was conscious. Uh, so Truman's first secretary of the Air Force back in 1948 pointed out to Congress that the word to use is not subsidy. The word to use is security. Uh, and in fact, the whole system was designed that way and stays that way. So that's the tribute to democracy and the free markets. Tribute to democracy and free markets is you rob the public by deceit uh, to pay, to, put to, to uh, uh, enrich the rich. That's free markets and democracy. And it's published without comment. Uh, another article, in, uh, and probably nobody notices, you know, because the, the concept of capitalism, just like the concept of democracy, is just gone. You know, nobody knows what it is. Democracy means deceive people into doing what the rich people want, and markets means making sure that make sure the public subsidizes the rich. Or to take another example, take say the Wall Street Journal, which you think would be the last holdout where somebody remembers what capitalism is. Well, they had a front lead article a couple of weeks ago uh, on various strategies that states, meaning like states of the union, were using to try to be more business friendly. And the, they picked two examples, Virginia and Maryland, who are sort of competing and to see who can most sponsor entrepreneurial values and be most business friendly and so on. And they said, well, for a while it looked like they have somewhat different strategies. That's why they were describing them. Turned that for a while, Maryland was doing better. Then it turned out Virginia is doing better. Now Virginia is doing better. They're more business friendly, more gung-ho about business and so on. All right, you read the article. Turns out it's not Virginia and Maryland. Uh, what it is is the suburbs of Washington, some of which are in Virginia and the others of which are in Maryland. And what are the two business strategies? 
uh, entrepreneurial strategies. Well, the suburbs of Washington figured they could rip off bi uh, the National Institute of Health and, the, and others develop biology-based industries. They were looking for biotechnology and so on. They figured that's going to be the big cash cow. Uh, and Virginia, which is more business-friendly, uh, decided that the old cash cow, the Pentagon, would probably be the best way to rip off public funds. Uh, so they were concentrating on electronics and telecommunications and so on. And it turned out that Virginia had the better strategy, the better business strategy. They made a better guess about which public funds to rob. Uh, and that's what it means to have entrepreneurial values. And it's, again, reported without comment. This just continues virtually without a break. You know. Uh, the New York, I'll give you one last example. The New Yorker had a rather good article, actually. You know, by now, the, the story about what's happening to the economy and to the population, which used to be what you know, crazies on the left talked about, uh, it's now sort of hit the public. You know, so you, you, know, you read it in the newspapers. The New Yorker had an article in which they reviewed the figures on decline of real wages and you know, increase in profits and the story you're familiar with. Uh, by a guy named Thomas Cassidy. It wasn't a bad article, actually, sort of reviewed the familiar facts. Uh, and then he ended up by saying, look, no one's to blame for this. It's just the market in its infinite and mysterious wisdom just has these effects and there's nothing you can do about it. And they gave three examples, exactly three examples in the article of the market in its infinite and mysterious wisdom, namely Grumman, McDonnell Douglas, and Hughes Aircraft. Uh, you know, maybe this is some kind of subtle irony that I'm missing, but these are three prototypes of publicly subsidized corporations. Grumman, Hughes, McDonnell Douglas, they wouldn't exist for two minutes if it wasn't for a huge public subsidy. So that's the market and its infinite and mysterious wisdom. Uh, when Clinton was announcing his grand vision of the free market future at the APEC conference in Seattle, he did the same thing. It was in the Boeing terminal, that's where he announced it. And he gave Boeing, Boeing, as the example of uh, the grand vision of the free market future. And there are big headlines in all the newspapers, and a lot of applause about our love of the free market and so on. It's unnecessary to comment. But it is kind of interesting. What it means is that the concept of capitalism and markets has disappeared as fully as the concept of democracy, which is an interesting fact about the modern period, and a kind of a natural effect of you know, of applying the Washington Consensus at home, because you really have to drive out any understanding of what's going on, namely that it's really existing free markets that are being imposed. Well, uh, all of these uh, current measures share one fundamental principle, and I guess really at the heart of it, uh, for, well, two, two related fundamental principles. One is they transfer wealth to the wealthy, and the second is they transfer decision-making power to the wealthy. Uh, so all of them have the effect, just think of through, what all, every one of them has the effect of putting more power to make decisions into the hands of unaccountable private tyrannies, what we call corporations, basically totalitarian institutions, uh, but they're un mostly unaccountable. Uh, and uh, uh, that's the effect, you think through the examples, every case of the Washington Consensus applied at home has exactly this effect. Uh, and a good part of the propaganda system has the same goal, in this case, surely conscious. Uh, so the propaganda system is designed, has been for years, to demonize uh, unions, which makes a lot of sense. Unions are a democratizing force in which the mass, one of the few ways in which the large mass of the population can pool, pool limited resources and work together for some common good, so that's that bad thing, democracy. So naturally you want to demonize and destroy unions, and that's been going on forever. Uh, and the other leading propaganda theme, and I don't mean by that, you know, like uh, just what you hear in the newspaper, reading the newspaper and so on, like the entertainment industry and television and everything else, uh, that is anti-politics, uh, meaning setting up a picture it's called anti-politics. The picture is a very specific kind of anti-politics. You have to establish the image, you know, get into people's heads that the government is the enemy, federal government. State governments are okay because they can be sort of controlled by business anyway, so it doesn't matter. But the federal government's sometimes a little too big to be pushed around, so it's the enemy. And it cannot be, nobody can dream of the possibility that the government is of, by, and for the people. That's impossible. It's an enemy to be hated and feared. Not that there aren't a lot of things wrong with it, but that's not what's wrong with it 
from their point of view, is it has a big defect. It's potentially influenceable by the population and big enough to stand up against private power. And that's the defect. So you have to regard it as the enemy. It cannot be of, by, and for the people. Uh, it's a kind of a them versus us business. Uh, this is uh, them is the government, which is the enemy. Us is all of us nice people, you know, sober working man, loyal wife, maybe extra job these days, uh, the hard-working executive toiling 20 hours a day, you know, for the benefit of all, the friendly banker who's out there trying to find, you know, give you money. That's us, you know. <laughs> and then there's them. Uh, them is the outsiders, uh, the un-Americans, uh, you know, the agitators, uh, union organizers, uh, big government, and so on, and sort of us versus them. That's the picture. Uh, that has been rammed into people's heads for at least 50 or 60 years by intensive propaganda everywhere. Movies, you know, television, textbooks, uh, just constant. Uh, uh, and not by accident. This, is, this part is all extremely conscious. We have a huge public relations industry which spends billions of year, year, uh, dollars a year on exactly this sort of thing, and consciously they even tell you about it. Well, why is it happening now, not, say, 30 years ago? Uh, one proposal is it's the market and its mysterious wisdom. We can put that aside. Uh, this is perfectly conscious social policy and also, hence, under social control. Second is we live in lean and mean times. We've got to tighten our belts. Complete nonsense. I mean, if you look at the business press, they're just ecstatic, you know, and have been for years. Um, business Week just came out a couple of days ago with the annual issue on the top 1,000 corporations. Uh, the headline is 1995 was one for the books. Uh, America's most subline. America's most valuable companies grew even more valuable by a record 35 percent. That's these lean and mean times we're in. Uh, another headline in Business Week reads, the problem now, what to do with all that cash uh, as the <laughs> coffers of corporate America are overflowing with surging profits. Uh, another one talks about the government, really great government. It says, the Gingrich Congress represents a milestone for business. Never before have so many goodies been showered so enthusiastically on America's entrepreneurs. The headline of that one, incidentally, is return to the trenches. You know, like we got to ask more. Our feeding frenzy has to go on from the nanny state. Uh, Fortune magazine, you know, the other big business journal, I mean, they can't even find the adjectives in the last couple of years to describe what's going on. One year it's dazzling, you know, the next year it's stupendous. I mean, uh, I'm waiting for the Fortune 500 issues, see what adjectives they come out with next week. Uh, what they've been double-digit profit growth for unheralded four years with pretty stagnant sales and uh, fortunately wages going down. Uh, CEO salaries are going through the roof and it's uncorrelated with performance. It's another interesting aspect of it. There have been now studies of it, so just some other thing it has nothing to do with markets or anything else. Uh, the, uh, and meanwhile, wages continue to decline, as does family income and so on. Uh, well, you know, nobody who even looks at the business press can believe that there are lean and mean times. As I said, the country is just awash with capital. Their problem is they don't know what to do with it, so therefore get more. You know. uh, another uh, 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 theme that's around now is you have to have what's called downsizing in order to be competitive. Well, the Bureau of Labor Statistics came out with its figures uh, up to last year, they have them for 1993. From, 18, from 1983 to 1993, the category of executives, managers, and administrative personnel grew 30 percent. Okay, that's downsizing. Uh, the fastest growing white collar population happens to be security guard. Uh, well, yeah, that's connected with uh, turning it into a third world country. You take a walk down San Salvador, you know, you'll see plenty of security guards. You know, rich people have to be protected. Uh, and furthermore, all these prisons you're throwing people into, they need security guards. So yeah, there's uh, their administrative personnel, and that's increasing, but so are uh, same in corporations. There's no downsizing going on, except for working people. That's quite different. Uh, why is it happening now? Anyway, those are, let's go back to why it's happening now. Well, the uh, fact is it's always going on, just depending on the weapons at hand. Uh, business, American business particularly, is highly class conscious and very open about it, incidentally. And it's always fighting a bitter class war. Uh, 
uh, you go back a century ago into what were called the gay 90s, when incidentally the international economy was about as, inter as gl the international economy was pretty much as like it is now in terms of capital flows and so on. It hasn't become more globalized in terms of trade and capital flow and so on than it was then, it may even be less so. Uh, the, uh, about a century ago, uh, it looked as if the game was over. You know, they were talking about the end of history, uh, perfection had been reached, uh, the, and the devil will take the hindmost society where everybody's for themselves and enrich yourselves and so on. It was monstrous for working people. Uh, very brutal, in fact, here. Uh, that was a century ago. Well, you know, it didn't end. You know, in Europe particularly, the social contract was slowly imposed, not easily. Uh, it didn't happen here by the Roaring Twenties, as they were called. Uh, labor had no voice. This is the, you know, the age of mass production and auto, auto, automobiles and so on. Labor was out of it. It was a business-run society almost completely, and it looked permanent. Again, you know, utopia of the masters, end of history, all this talk. Uh, the 1930s, it proved to be wrong. There was a lot of popular organizing, popular protest. It rammed through elements of the social contract that had been achieved in Europe decades earlier, uh, and that just caused hysteria in the business community. You read the business press, it was talking about, you know, the hazard facing uh, manufacturers and the rising political power of the masses and how we're going to face disaster unless we figure out some way to reverse this and control their minds and control them and so on. A huge propaganda campaign began right after the Wagner Act was packed, passed, 1935. Uh, in, the, in, those, in the next two years, the National Association of Manufacturers, its public relations budget multiplied by a factor of 20. You know, as they recognize that force alone is not going to be enough. The U.S. has a very violent labor history and plenty of people, workers were getting killed, but it was clear that this wasn't going to be enough. They had to have huge propaganda. It was sort of put on, that's when all this harmony business that I was talking about got uh, designed. You know, it was a specific design as to how to carry out what they called scientific methods of strike breaking by controlling communities and so on. Well, it was put on hold during the war and then it picked up right after the Second World War was over uh, with uh, a, an enormous propaganda campaign. I mean, you can't believe the scale until you look at it. And the purpose was very explicit. Uh, the purpose was to win the everlasting battle for the minds of men, uh, which have to be indoctrinated with the capitalist story. Uh, as we sell our preferred way of life, and on and on. These are all just quotes from mainstream PR literature. Uh, and it was very substantial uh, and uh, aimed precisely at what I described. Um, they describe what they're doing, and you can see it in the propaganda, the schools, the entertainment industry, everything else. Well, what happened in the 1970s? But what happened is there were some changes in the international economy and in technology and so on, which just put new weapons into the hands of the uh, masters. Uh, one crucial factor, which everyone points to, is an enormous growth in uh, uh, financial uh, capital, financial transactions. It just boomed, short-range financial transactions. That came about partly because of the dismantling of the post-war Bretton Woods system of regulated currencies, which kind of made currencies free-floating. The Nixon administration just dismantled it. Partly it came about for technical reasons. I mean, the telecommunications revolution, which was, of course, publicly subsidized, at that point made it possible to transfer funds very rapidly. Uh, so like you, you can, about a, by now it's estimated around a trillion dollars a day, just shift up and back from one market to another, very short-term transactions, all in, and at a hu the, uh, the the and, and aimed at something. They're all aimed at low growth and high profits and low wages. And that's a, that is a factor that's driving policy in that direction. I don't think it's by any means an uncontrollable factor, but it is a, it's definitely a factor. And that's just put a lot, and the, the, the changes are in the, the, in the composition of tr capital transactions are very striking. Around, from about maybe the time when you have data, like late 19th century up till about 1970, rough estimate was that about 90% of capital transfers had to do with the real economy, you know, with investment and trade, 10% speculation. By 1990, the figures had reversed. By 1995, the latest uh, UN Economic Commission uh, estimate was about 5% 
real economy, 95% speculation, short-term speculation like against currencies, which is essentially aimed at driving down growth and increasing profits and lowering wages. This was understood very quickly by the late 70s, and there were proposals made, for example, by James Tobin, the Yale economist, Nobel Prize winner at an American Economic Association presidential address in 1978, simply su suggested a simple reform. It's low tax, very low tax on short-term financial transactions just to slow it down, you know, throw a little sand in the gears. Probably worked. It's been called the Tobin tax, but it's not getting anywhere because uh, the weapon is a very important one. That weapon has been used very efficiently for all the purposes that have been described, and there are other things. Uh, is it out of control? Is there nothing we can do? Well, there's no reason to believe that. I mean, elementary reforms, like, say, the Tobin tax, could have a, maybe a big effect. Uh, furthermore, more globally, all of these interchanges, as I mentioned, the international economy is not more integrated by most measures than it was 100 years ago, in fact, less in many respects. And the transactions that are going on are mostly within the big three regions, United States, Japan, and Europe. Uh, now, that's under political control. You know, that's not out of political control. Uh, democratic societies in the th these three areas could control this. Uh, uh, the idea that it's somehow, you know, kind of impossible to control all over the world, that's just not true. You look at the flows, they're internal to the highly developed, rich societies where theoretically there are democratic governments and could impose all sorts of restrictions. Uh, furthermore, uh, all the talk about corporate greed and everything is really crucially beside the point in my point of view, I think, and should be recognized as a very big regression from what working people and a lot of others understood very well a century ago. Talk about corporate greed is nonsense. Uh, corporations are greedy by their nature. There's no such, you know, the no, nothing else. They're instruments for interfering with markets to maximize profit and wealth and market control. You can't make them more or less greedy. I mean, maybe you can sort of force them. To be, it's like taking a totalitarian state and saying, be less brutal. Well, yeah, maybe you can get uh, a totalitarian state to be less brutal, but that's not the point. Uh, the point is not to get a tyranny to be less brutal, but to get rid of it. Uh, now, like 150 years ago, uh, that was understood. I mean, if you read the labor press, there was a very lively labor press right around here, you know, Lowell and Lawrence and places like that around the mid-19th century, uh, run by artisans and uh, what they call factory girls, young women from farms who were working there. And they weren't asking the autocracy to be less brutal. They were saying, get rid of it. You know, they, and in fact, that makes perfect sense. These are not, these are human institutions. You know, there's nothing graven in stone about them. Uh, they're created early in this century with their present powers. Uh, they come from the same intellectual roots as the other modern forms of totalitarianism, namely Stalinism and fascism, and they have no more legitimacy than they do. Uh, so it's not a, I mean, yeah, let's try and make them, make the autocracy less brutal if that's the short term possibility, but we should have the sophistication of, say, factory girls in Lowell 150 years ago and recognize that this is just degrading and intolerable and that, uh, as they put it, uh, those who work in the mills should own them and on to everything else, and that's democracy. You don't have, that. You don't have democracy. Okay. 